welcome to uh, each of you. I'm Alan Winter, a personal CEO of Genome BC, and it's a special pleasure to welcome each of you here on such a rainy day outside. We have an exciting day today with interesting speakers, and we have a list of speaker biographies uh, there as well, so make sure you meet each one. My only regret is that there's a very short time to listen to each person. <laughs> However, we found over the years that the Winter Symposium and actually the Genomics Forum are great places to network and think about new uh, projects. So this spark process has resulted in some of our best projects. Uh, you'll see Genome BC's job in the community is really to help spark ideas and develop them into tangible and fundable projects. So we fund those projects through Genome Canada's competitions nationally, <coughs> such as the recent agri-food competition, the natural resource competition, and we hope one upcoming in health in 2016, or through Genome BC competitions, such as proof of concept or the user partnership program, or through partnership agreements with CIHR, Brain Canada, the EU, and the list goes on. In each case, there are specific co-funders for each project. So Genome BC has recently gone through development approval of a, a new five-year or current five-year plan, 2015 to 2020, and as a result, we've shifted emphasis on some of the things we're doing in the funding uh, to include dealing directly with companies, and, do, and to, as we do today with universities. Of course, using public funds, then those contracts with companies would become repayable. And so consequently, we've reorganized to provide focus in these specific areas, such as bringing on Pat Brady at the frontier as director of our industry innovation program for later stage companies. We've moved Gabe Kalmar to become vice president of entrepreneurship and commercialization, focusing on early stage SME support. And we've recruited Dr. Catalina Lopez Correa, the Catalina is right here, uh, to become vice president of sector development and CSO. Now, just as an aside, for those of you that know our organization, we have combined Dave and Brad into one charming person. <laughs> now, this is, this, is, this is only possible in the world of genomics. <laughs> anyway, we'll have an opportunity to, uh, to welcome Katarina most warmly to the community later in the day at 3 o'clock. So, welcome again. And over to the moderators for today. So that's uh, Gabe and Jenny and Lena. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. 
uh, first have off the ranks, I'll try and uh, work through this really quickly because this is a long panel of people. Um, so, entrepreneurship at UBC. Uh, who are we? We are UBC's accelerator, uh, venture accelerator. We're part of campus in the new Robert H. Lee Alumni Center, picture here, the corner of University and East Mall. Um, we supply or provide programs and resources for ventures associated with uh, uh, UBC affiliated faculty, staff, and students. Our vision is to inspire and encourage entrepreneurial thinking to create innovative commercial and social ventures. We're all about content creation. Um, what we do, we support UBC entrepreneurs from idea to innovation. We have a platform of support and resources that I've shown here. I'm not going to run through it in detail. Um, underpinning everything that we do, we've got about 70 active entrepreneurial mentors um, supporting the venture teams that we work with. Um, if we have a look at our process funnel from idea to funding, um, we start with ideas of all kinds. We help those people to crystallize, those entrepreneurs to crystallize their ideas into a business hypothesis. Uh, we build a business model, do some market validation, funnel them through to actually company building, uh, and then of course we've got a seed fund um, that will invest in uh, ventures that come through our process. Just having a look at the funnel itself, um, which is largely comprised of ventures from life sciences, applied sciences, and Sawyer School of Business. Um, to date, we've had 400 venture ideas registered with us. That's since inception in September 2013. Um, we're, of course, not working with 400 ventures, that would be impossible. So the funnel process helps us to stratify the portfolio of ventures. We're working with about 125, 100 to 125 at any one time. Um, we've got 25 companies currently in our venture building process right now. And uh, since 2013, we've got uh, 26 ventures that we can classify as alumni to hit some sort of a development milestone, whether that's funding, um, a strategic partnership, launch of a product, or uh, acceptance into like another competitive incubator such as a Y Combinator. Uh, now, of course, in the life sciences at UBC, UBC is known as a uh, life science innovator. Over 60% of its uh, uh, research, annual research budget of $500 million is spent in life sciences. And so this is a real priority for entrepreneurship at UBC, and it's, it's uh, what I'm exclusively um, so, the resources that we bring to bear for those life science ventures is myself and an EIR who will be uh, hiring in the not too distant future. In addition to our mentor network and our programs, and we're convening a venture review panel um, that will meet regularly with the ventures and provide them with some real life experiences if they would be with um, partners or investors <coughs> and getting feedback, getting them prepared for uh, 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 company building and company launch. This is just a view of our uh, life science portfolio. We stratified it along the uh, typical um, categories that you would stratify. I'm not going to go through in detail, but if anyone would like to have a look at the slides, uh, I can send them to them. Um, here's some notable ventures that you might uh, be familiar with or be aware of. Our view is medical, uh, extant biosciences, Nanazen, Aspect, Anandia, Akuba. Um, our long term vision is to help to build an interconnected entrepreneurial happy to speak to anyone who shares that vision and, and uh, would like to participate in that. Um, and just in closing, I'd like to acknowledge our generous sponsors, BCIC, I saw Dean in the crowd, um, Genome BC and NRC IRAP, and in particular with Genome BC, um, not many people may be aware, but prior to EADBC's launch in September 2013, um, the university was a recipient of an entrepreneurial education grant.
be on scientific articles globally, but we actually do better than that on the citation of those articles. We're, we're heavy hitters in actually producing scientific inventions. But in fact, getting those out the other side, we don't do a very good job at. Um, some of the key things we get Ds in, in patenting itself, uh, in venture financing, uh, uh, and also in patenting firms less than five years old. So it's science firms. We get a D internationally. We, we don't create enough of those types of firms. It's a difficult space. And when you look, oh sorry, can you go next slide? So when you look at the reasons why, um, this is a poll that was done of, ex of firms, of managers in existing firms, and saying, what's keeping you from doing more innovation? What's, what's the major barriers for you to innovate? And what came up predominantly was uncertainty and risk, which seems a kind of counterintuitive since the most opportunity exists in conditions of uncertainty and risk. Um, but that's a barrier uh, across um, uh, culturally and in terms of the skill set of managers in companies and entrepreneurs in Canada to deal with environments of uncertainty and risk and to manage through them in a way that gives them exposure to the upside opportunity and mitigates risk on the downside. So that's what we teach about um, here at the Baby School Business in a number of programs. And this is our innovation ecosystem at SFU. Um, you probably can't see uh, all the detail there, but there's three different areas that we focus on. One is four credit courses in innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, and that is in this uh, on your far left. Um, and the two courses I'm going to talk about here, we do it both at the undergrad and the graduate level, but I'm going to talk about our Management of Technology MBA and also our new graduate certificate in Science and Technology Commercialization. And then in the center area, we have not-for-credit programming and training, still up to proof of concept of idea. And in the far side, and that um, uh, uh, Brian Darcy also will talk about a little bit later at Innovation Boulevard, we have a number of activities that are going in terms of scaling up and commercializing the ideas itself. So incubators and accelerators, Innovation Boulevard fits there. Um, you can see the areas of red are the different programs we have going on. Now what I want to focus on in my short time this morning is our four credit programs because I think that's where we have something quite unique to offer. Um, we've had the Management of Technology MBA program has been going on for 15 years. We launched in, in uh, 2000 where we've been training cohorts of uh, scientists and engineers usually with 10 years of work experience. They come back part time uh, and there's a biotech stream and they learn about how to manage in conditions of risk and uncertainty. Um, but we also realized more recently that uh, there are PhD scientists who have been in our MBA program and others who don't need a full MBA um, and who just want a customized mini MBA, giving them the tools to manage in conditions of risk and uncertainty. And that's why we launched this graduate certificate in science technology commercialization with a big focus on life sciences. We also do this at the undergraduate level. And if I was to talk about our training here at Simon Fraser University uh, about innovation and entrepreneurship, it would, I would stress the interdisciplinary nature. We open it across all faculties of the university and support them. Uh, that it was, uh, that we have faculty that their research area is in innovation and entrepreneurship that are taking tied to teaching on these programs. That we also have an active group of mentors through Venture Connection. Who, uh, who are matched with these teams. And that we, we have a strong commitment to social innovation as well. Um, and I just wanted to point out lastly that it's very different when you're talking about science-based ventures, the kind of ventures that many of you um, are interested in. They have a lot more uncertainty, market and technology uncertainty, and they have a longer time in commercialization where you deal with that uncertainty. So it's very different than the kind of other technology ventures that are in town, in software and apps development, etc. And so that's the area that we teach skills for, and this is the program that I'm talking about. Uh, we launched this year, we have 18 PhD and postdoc uh, scientists who are looking at big picture ideas in life sciences, in clean tech, nanotech, advanced materials, and we're helping to change their frame of reference and the way they think about commercializing their innovation ideas. And that's what we hope to be able to contribute uh, on the educational side to, uh, to the, the BC area. Thank you. Hi, so um, BC Technology Industry Association has been around for uh, over 20 years. It's traditionally focused on ICT, hardware, 
the software. The programs that are available at uh, the industry association have been really focused on commercialization and growing revenue. So since 2010, we started a pilot program uh, to really focus on helping some of the more promising companies move along. And then we received some uh, additional funding from NRC, uh, known as Kate Funding, and a number of you are familiar with that. And we did a, a one-year intense program. Um, and the new investment for the companies who took part in that was uh, $59 million, and the new revenue growth uh, for that uh, group was $46 million. So we, we get about 100 new companies coming into the program, and about half of those are really active in any way. We did the first time, for the first time, a real cohort-based group, um, ICT focused, uh, which was uh, a competition to get in. We had 30 companies apply. And then through two rounds of the competition and industry experts who knew the space, we selected three companies to really, really focus on in, in a six-month experiment. And those companies uh, grew dramatically, uh, mainly because they, they had to have a, something that was in market already. And the problems they faced were not technical. <coughs> the technical risk was already uh, taken care of, and it was really the business challenges. That they didn't know how to hire people. They didn't know how to expand into new markets. So we helped them uh, with that, and the results were very promising. There's about 300% revenue growth over a six-month period, which is very, um, with, you know, made us very happy about that. Over the last roughly five years, the number of uh, technology industry association members that identify themselves as being life sciences or health tech of some kind has grown from effectively zero to nearly 20% of all the membership. So this is a very interesting sector. There's a lot going on. It seems to be making a bit of a comeback locally. Um, they are all over the place. They are medical devices, diagnostics, digital health, uh, therapeutics, big data. We have a couple of actual pharma companies, which is a bit of a surprise for us um, that take part in the programs. Again, they're focusing on the business problems, not the technical problems. So what we did with this small cohort last year, which we called hypergrowth uh, for the ICT sectors, we want to do that now in partnership with NRC, our big funding, and with Genome BC, uh, as, a, as a big partner, obviously, um, is to do this again with a focus on health technologies. Same idea. It will be uh, three to four high potential companies. It will be a contest to get into this. It will be a couple rounds of vetting. The first round will be simply, do they qualify? Are they promising? Are they trainable? Are they comfortable with risk? And Alicia for, for helping us pick out some of those, those people. Um, and really want to actually commercialize. Um, and then it'll be a final panel of, of some people who, who are industry experts, such as Natalie and Brian, um, will be the final uh, group to select the final three or four companies that will pour the support on. The other difference is that instead of a six month board, which is fairly easy to do with, with already in market software companies, it will be a 12 month program because we realize the road. Uh, is longer, um, and the measurements will be like, do we find them new investments so they can keep going and overcome the risk? Do we get them to a, a point where they can have a licensing deal, a good partnership signed off on, or heaven forbid, revenue, um, or attract some top talent to come in and take part in that? Part of the thesis behind this is really what goes on in, uh, in the schools is Here's the admissions to uh, solder uh, to get in right now. It's 92.2%. That's the highest requirements to get into any faculty. Admissions to UBC Science is 91.9, second highest. In SFU Mechatronics, low, low to mid 90s. So these are the, the best and brightest uh, that, that are going to school. These are sharp lines that are very, very capable. We don't expect someone who does seven years at solder to go into a lab and extract DNA and do the sequence and figure out what it means. But quite often it seems that we expect people to come out of sciences after doing seven years and being an expert to go in and immediately know how to put together a good licensing deal. This is crazy. This is complete insanity. This doesn't make any sense at all. So what we want to do is part of this is get these teams together and say, let's sit down. You're very good at this. You're very good at this. Not that they're intellectually incapable of doing it. It's a simply a matter of they haven't done it for five, six, seven years, a decade, two, 22 decades. And so that's, that's the direction we want to go and see the seeds come. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Midber. I work at uh, Genome Canada, very closely with 
GLBC, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. We are a not-for-profit. We're funded by the federal government, and we offer a lot of different um, programs to fund academic research, and now we're moving more into translation and commercialization. And what I wanted to talk to you about today, I only have one slide, and this is uh, the funding landscape slide that, that I've been putting together. This is a draft, so please don't hold me to whether the lines go this way, that way, or... And, and in fact, it would be great to talk with the panel on whether I've put the people in the right place. But what I wanted to convey to you today is that there still exists a, an innovation gap in Canada. And it's not going away. There are some really good programs that are helping with these efforts. And first I'll talk about what we're doing at Genome Canada. And then I'll touch on what some other people are doing. And a couple of them are on the panel here today. And um, maybe this can lead to further discussion as we, uh, as we talk as a group. So Genome Canada has really been focused on the discovery area. We've been funding for the last 15 years large-scale science. LSARPS is our lead um, program for academic research. You can get up to about $10 million in grant funding for large-scale applied research. And uh, this has been very helpful for driving a lot of science in Canada in the genomics space. We've also been looking at areas of bioinformatics, um, a new program, Disruptive Innovation in Genomics, where we're looking at really cutting-edge genomics tools or products that could revolutionize the way we're moving forward in a, a number of different sectors. And we also have set up some sequencing centers, proteomics, metabolomics across Canada. The main program that I work on is the GAP program, and that's really trying to bridge user communities, which can include companies or public sector groups, not-for-profits, government entities, with academics. And we partner these two together. We funded 25 projects to date. We have about 40 million for this program, and we're, we're near the end of our funding cycle, but we're planning to get some more money from the federal government soon to keep this program going. And it's been, it's been a, just a terrific way to link together end users with academic research to try and move innovation forward. So we're trying to push down this continuum all the way to market. Just to give you a, a sense of where I come from, I used to be a venture capitalist for uh, eight years. I ran two profitable funds here in Canada, investing in about 25 biotech companies. And I was kind of at the far end, and we were all, always looking for later stage assets, something that had already gone through proof of concept. There's a number of other programs above there that are pushing through this continuum, CIHR and NSERC, and some of the local provincial organizations like CQDM and OCE have programs that allow this academic research to move forward. And then at the top there, there are groups like Accelerex, and we'll hear more about that from Natalie. We'll hear more about the new GBC fund from um, Pat Brady. And there are a number of different groups that are trying to move this forward into the application space. The main problem, though, that still exists in Canada is there's this gap for small, medium enterprises. So if you're a small biotech company CEO, and you look around Canada, you say, where am I going to get funding? Do I go to the government? The government doesn't really have any programs. We don't have an SBIR type program in the U.S., which invests about $750 million a year into small companies. And we don't have venture capitalists that are coming down the early stage uh, and looking at those opportunities. And so there's this funding gap here. And what I hope to talk to you more about today is how we can find a solution for this gap. Um, we're looking at new possibilities of trying to invest into companies and move them for, for, uh, further down into the market space. But we need to, we need to uh, bridge this valley of death. And, um, I think there's a number of ways that the government could get involved, as well as the private sector, and I hope that this will lead to further discussion on the panel today. Thank you.
which is actually brilliant. Thank you, Michael. Um, hello, uh, I'm Natalie Dakers, and thank you so much, Gabe, and Genome BC for inviting me here today. But um, I, I think it's nice to uh, build off the story that um, Michael was telling us, because I very much see this in a similar way, I think, as most of the panelists do, that this truly is an innovation continuum, and, and we're all trying to ultimately get to that goal of um, seeing more companies stay and grow in Canada. And I think in many ways we're, we're very fortunate in Canada because we have a lot of different entities that are working together to really bolster our industry and to see great success. Obviously from my perspective I'm seeing this predominantly from the health, but I think a lot of the principles that we talk about are very much translatable into um, other parts of the story. So, um, what I'm going to talk to you today about briefly is Accelerex. This is uh, a new entity that has been created over the last year or so. Um, and what this comes of is very much that gap that Mike was talking about, um, the, seed, the seed stage, that we have um, a need to uh, seed companies in a way that we can bolster them and, and position them such that they can stay and grow in Canada. So Accelerex, it's a um, national entity, and, and what we're doing is we're building off the Centers of Excellence for Commercialization and Research program that the Feds created in 2008. And the wonderful thing about that program is it's allowed a number of really interesting business models to evolve and to show their position in this continuum very much from a translational point of view. Their job is to see and pull out very interesting technologies from the discovery engine that we have across this country and to put more resources towards them so that we can see better commercialization success of early stage technology. And where Accelerex comes in is to work with those pipelines, specifically in the health area. Um, we have affiliations with a number of these um, health commercialization centers in Canada, CBRD of course being one of them, um, but PC Triad here in, um, in BC, um, Mars Innovation, uh, Center for Regenerative Medicine, the Medical Devices Group out in Ottawa, as well as um, the Probe, uh, Center for Probe Development in McMaster. But basically, are you serious? It's already up? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> Anyhow, the bottom line is we're providing seed investment. This is through a convertible note program, and we have a partnership with BDC. And together we have about $20 million to put into this pool. And then following um, that, we bring in other investments. So that basically the rounds that we're doing are about two to three million. And what that allows is these early stage companies to really get their feet on the ground and ultimately get over that gap so we can get clinical data. So this is what we're setting out to do. We've made two investments so far, working on six other companies right now. And so uh, what we hope is that this is something that um, really takes off and that we can draw their other people into that gap and work with many different people that we have here on the town today. Thank you very much. So what are we trying? 
trying to do commercialization for CDRD is really our main focus. Uh, we are trying to maximize the return from publicly funded research in the universities and hospitals. And as our colleague Vanessa Key said, uh, we do great <coughs> discovery. We do great science in Canada, but we're not seeing the outcomes. And that was one of the things that we are trying to address is how to find the best, more promising technologies, advance them in a focused way toward commercialization and investability. Um, part of what we do is bring together technologies and funding partners. Uh, many of us uh, actually, when I walked in, I realized how, how much we work together with Accelerex, with GLBC, uh, with all the other groups to try and advance technologies forward. Uh, nothing advances in a vacuum, and working together is really the only way that you can generate enough momentum, critical mass, and investment to advance the technology. And I think we we'll see that over and over again. Um, we also help uh, small companies uh, grow and validate their technologies. So we work with uh, a, a growing group of small companies and we're interested in talking to more small companies. Uh, we work with them collaboratively to um, get them a piece of data that is important for the next round of financing or getting them an additional proof of concept that shows that they really do have something that can advance for the clinic. And we also introduce them to uh, funding partners to try and again add momentum to their story to take them further along the commercialization path. I think you've already seen a funnel, so this is our funnel. Um, we source uh, technologies from our academic uh, partners in universities and hospitals across Canada and also through our global network. Um, they go through our funneling review attrition process into CDRD, and what we see on the outside is what we drive for investable assets. And that can take the form of um, licenses to existing companies, uh, funded research collaborations with industry partners, new codes, which again go on to uh, get funded through Accelerax and venture capital. And the idea is that we're generating revenues for ourselves and revenue shares from the originating um, institutions, generating that revenue to kind of keep the continuum and the machine going. Uh, here's some of our recent spin-offs. Uh, Kairos, we had a, a press release um, in the early part of January where we have a Exciting transaction assignments from the local company, um, and hopefully, this is the beginning of uh, Canada's next great biologic story. Sika is another one of our companies, uh, Zucara, and when I go through the list, I really see what an instrumental role Genome you know, BC has played in the development of many of these technologies, and also, you know, uh, a couple of these companies are, are up for Accelerax consideration. So, again, we see this working together in partnership to advance technology. Uh, this is just a little snapshot of some of the SMEs that we're working with. Vita, Eupraxia, and Star Sana. We work with them collaboratively um, and use our uh, resources to help them advance their technologies to the point where they can attract new money into their story.
So we basically look at our success from the outcomes perspective and then build backwards. In order to do that, we pulled together um, the partnerships that are already in BC, many of which are in this room, many of which are not even on this slide. And we said that if we can focus on making a difference in an individual who's receiving health care, and then we can turn around and innovate that to see that we can get it for multiple individuals, how would we do that and how would we draw on uh, the many, many partners? Uh, the founding partners in this have been both the City of Surrey, Sun Fraser University, and Fraser Health. And then pretty much as a regional initiative, um, the vision has become to develop uh, Silicon Valley's for health technologies. A couple of uh, successes uh, in short order which have helped to fuel our progress. Uh, certainly, um, we have partnered widely with both the federal funding and the provincial funding. This was all actually seeded from, uh, initially from BC uh, provincial funding and we have support from BCIC, we have support from WD, we have support from IREPS and that sort of thing. My tax has been huge. Um, importantly, that's leveraged. So we have a very strong ROI for our leverage factor. And I'll just call out one example for that, which is the um, Networks of Centers of Excellence AgeWell, which is a $70 million national initiative. And that uh, on the West Coast, we <coughs> uh, primarily our efforts. The important point is tangible. So I want to yeah, tell you a little bit about our concrete examples of successes, because that's really how we rate whether or not we're making a difference or not. It's all well to accelerate a product, but if it doesn't get out and actually show that it helps somebody, then, then you know, we haven't done our job. We risk. Uh, sometimes they're successful, sometimes they're fails. We've got lots of companies, we've got lots of uh, clinicians and lots of university investigators. But we pull them into one demonstrated example, and then we try that, and we try another, and another. So I'm showing you here is our, um, probably our poster child example. This is Captain Trevor Green very well known uh, in the brain injury community, we call him the Rick Hansen of brain injury. He was struck in Afghanistan with an axe and left for dead, possibly vegetative. Um, was going to continue in a care home as a vegetative person uh, uh, for the rest of his life that he was otherwise healthy. We used health technology through brain imaging and assistive devices to help him rewire his brain to the point where he could walk again, um, have another child, get on with life, challenge Stephen Harper on the environment, um, and uh, become, as he said to his kids, bionic. Uh, in September, this is him at SFU Surrey walking across for the first demonstration in the history of the world to use robotic exoskeleton technology uh, to walk. Those steps are his training steps uh, because uh, he, myself, and many others uh, from this community are getting him to go to the top of Everest. So, um, this is sort of an example that we like to show for ourselves and for others to see that you can use technology to make an immediate impact, to its impact on the quality of someone's life and care, but also a huge impact on our health economy. And from that, we partner, of course, with uh, companies that are multinational companies. We spin off our own companies. The technology in here is both the assistive technologies and the brain recording home health technologies that are driving uh, Trevor are going to now go up worldwide. And um, probably, I think, in December, we were quite pleased because this, in fact, uh, was uh, one of the clips in both Global and CBC in terms of the top news stories um, for Canada in 2015. And that came right out of Home Road in BC through partnerships just like this. So thank you very much. and 
and uh, commercialization stories, companies and profiles and speakers, and we had over 4,000 attendees, 120 exhibits. Uh, so it was quite, quite, a, uh, quite, a, quite a couple of two days last week where everybody was probably just still recovering from all the networking that, that, that happened in the, uh, the trade show floor. So we'll be doing it again next year. Please look out for it. It's, uh, it's something not to be missed if you didn't get a chance to go to it this year. The BC Innovation Council is a Crown Paper Corporation for provincial government. Um, I think, for the most part, one of our main flagship programs, and I've put a uh, slide up here just to highlight the BC Acceleration Network. Um, a large part of what we do is, is done through our partners. Uh, so we, we develop programs generally, and we work in collaboration with the community to identify gaps in the commercialization and entrepreneurship ecosystem. And then we work with our partners to develop these programs and get them into the community for, for startups. The Acceleration Network is an alliance of about 14 partners across the province that are all working together to deliver a range of programs that support technology entrepreneurship across all kinds of different sectors. And I'd like to highlight that. Um, Life Sciences, as we've heard it today, typically is viewed as, as, as drug development. Um, by, by most people without, without thinking sort of in a more diverse manner, but to, to me it's actually quite, quite larger and quite more diverse. We get into medical instruments, we get into a range of, of life sciences applications that, for example, may be used in, in oil and gas applications. One that comes to mind uh, particularly uh, is, is the use of genomics to identify um, corrosion in, in pipelines. Uh, and this was an education for me, so what it, what it gave, gave to me was a certain sense that, that life sciences is very broad within our technology and, and so it's great to see so many folks collaborating. Um, within the context of the BC Acceleration Network, uh, we deliver a specific program called the Venture Acceleration Program. And for all intents and purposes, it's an intense training and executive coaching program for startups. We've learned a lot over the last 25 years, 30 years or so, bringing companies to market, bringing technologies to market. And what we try to do um, is, is curate all of the best practices that have emerged over that period of time. And, and every new wave of entrepreneurs that are, that are hitting the streets, so to speak, uh, will get a, a really intensive education in some of these best practices. And many of my colleagues uh, here today are also training uh, entrepreneurs on many of these same, uh, these same ideas and, and theories. And then we put them into practice through, through executive level coaching from entrepreneurs that have already built companies before. A um, couple more programs that I'd like to bring to your attention with BCIC are our tech, tech Works. Uh, those are two programs, the Innovator Skills Initiative and, and a co-op program. The, the co-op program is for first year co-ops to get them connected into uh, startups. Co-ops typically are not going into startups, they're going to larger companies. So we're really trying to focus getting co-ops engaged with startups and it's for first, first year students. The Innovator Skills Initiatives is, is not necessarily for first year students, it's, it's across the board um, and really seeks to try to connect students to uh, early stage companies, but in addition to giving them project based work to do uh, in their role, it also exposes them to a variety of, of specific entrepreneurial uh, endeavors within that company and gives them sort of a foundation in, in the entrepreneurship part of, of building that company. Um, so, I, just, I think I'll just end by saying um, there's a lot more uh, at BCIC than what I'm just presenting here today. I think if you peel back the onion, you'll find us uh, as supporters, either in kind or, or from a funding point of view, in, in pretty well every program in the province. Um, and uh, we're, we're happy to be in the community, we're happy to be here today, and I look forward to your questions and meeting all of you later in the day. Thank you.
and other academia institutions. And GOBC obviously has a very strong presence with uh, many of the world leading research institutions here in BC and elsewhere, and also many of the healthcare uh, providers in the province. And GOBC also has a terrific network of co investors around the world, and here is a quick perspective of some of those major companies out there and some of our local companies as well. And uh, GOBC has also had fairly extensive experience funding quite a number of innovator companies, startups in the province. And uh, so basically I'm very privileged to be involved with the group. And they, as Alan has alluded to at the start of the session today, he's alluded to uh, a new five-year strategic plan that will probably deepen the emphasis on that commercialization and entrepreneurship uh, efforts in the province and there's an intent to invest roughly 300 million across this five-year period in not only discovery and apply but a heavier amount also into the translational and the commercialization sector. Hopefully we'll advance roughly 30 products in this period and across many of the strong sectors in BC and we are, and that brings me to my uh, uh, recent uh, joining of the GOBC, we are now launching a new commercialization fund called the I-squared fund or the Industry Innovation Fund and we are focusing on the gap that Michael uh, has identified, that gap with the small and medium sized enterprises. So the I-squared fund basically is going to offer support to uh, fairly early stage companies. These are companies that are approaching uh, commercialization status. They have already identified a pathway to commercialization. They've hopefully already identified and achieved a research proof of principle or concept. And they've also probably had some initial conversations at least with uh, potential customers and validated their value proposition. We are also looking to have companies that will create economic and social benefits for BC. And we intend to allocate roughly $100,000 to $1 million per company investment. And we are seeking uh, companies that will have matching funds available. And often our investments will be milestone driven, where we will look for achievements of goals before uh, perhaps releasing a certain portion of the funds. And our money will be repayable, and I'll get a bit deeper into that in a second. And we'll access existing genome BC network and expertise. These are various categories of uh, sectors and technologies that we will intend to invest in. We are looking to invest in uh, life sciences, and that basically means a company that is uh, tackling a biological challenge or employing the use of biological tools. And this obviously applies across many sectors, as Dean uh, mentioned just previously. Of course, it doesn't hurt if you have a disruptive technology. We will definitely be looking for those. And our key financial terms, we are basically offering uh, repayable funding. It's nationally, I'll call it pre-commercialization venture debt. We will use below market interest rates, usually prime plus 3%. We will have roughly a five-year period, grace period, I'll call it, from the point of disbursement until the repayment is expected to start. The repayment schedule will be roughly another two to three years. There will be no prepayment penalties. We are looking for a bit of an upside in terms of having a royalty on sales. This royalty will be capped on two times the uh, principal, and that cap can be reduced if there is an early prepayment. So if you are uh, interested in looking, learning more about the IQ Fund, or if you do have a uh, company opportunity, please contact me at the uh, uh, emails noted here with the information I have. And going into overtime, but coming soon we also intend to have two new programs supporting entrepreneurship and commercialization that will, one, involve the uh, province's accelerators and incubators, and two, we may also do some direct seed support for early stage startups. Thank you very much. <laughs>